Hi folks, it's Dr. Rob Sivers. I am the Carb Addiction Doc and I have a deep apology, an ignorance apology to all women. To all women, I apologize as a practicing physician that I was not more attentive and more attuned to certain aspects. And I'm going to address the particular aspect. As a metabolic physician, we deal with hormones. We deal with hormones, we deal with hormonal disruption. And I have routinely get asked, I see a lot of women on hormone replacement therapy, on birth control uh, when they're younger. I see a lot of women on a variety of female, or what I call gynecologic hormones. And I haven't spent enough time understanding and looking at that. I've still got a lot to learn, so I'm still very ignorant about it. But here's where the apology comes from. In talking to some of my gynecologic colleagues, when we talked about hormone replacement therapy, the consensus there from some of them, albeit some of the males, was that the primary reason to put people, to put women, postmenopausal women, on hormone replacement therapy, you really didn't want to do it because of the risk of cancer, the risk of blood clots. So they magnified the risk. Cancer and blood clots was the big thing. And uh, while those risks are there, those risks can definitely be mitigated and reduced. They aren't actually risks from the estrogen. They're risks from the general metabolic health, which I understand. But these docs were saying that the reason they prescribed to postmenopausal medication, uh, uh, hormone replacement therapy, was for feminine dryness and for libido. And while I don't want to minimize that, I think those are essential, they're very important, and they are what I call gynecologic reasons to be on estrogen, progesterone, and maybe, I'm going to discuss this, some testosterone. Those are the gynecologic reasons, and each female, each woman, should have that gynecologic sex drive discussion with their physician and be open about it. Be open about that with your gynecologist. But that's the gynecologic realm. And I'm very comfortable there. I've advocated for that. I've had those discussions. Here's where the apology is. Uh, and it, it's an interesting trap that many, many physicians fall into and many people fall into. Is this. When I mention the word estrogen, progesterone, or testosterone, pretty much everybody automatically thinks man and woman. They think sexuality, they think uh, sex, they think gender, they think sexual function. Uterus, penis, testes. But the reality is those words are only linked with those things because they have a role to play there. But I would tell you that that's actually a very small role of those hormones in the whole body. I'll give you a, a, a parallel. I'm going to use the word of a hormone and you tell me what it's connected to. The hormone's insulin. What does insulin do? What does insulin do? And almost everybody's going to tell me that insulin regulates blood sugar. And yes, in the modern era of carbophilia and massive excessive amounts of carbohydrates, insulin has taken on that dysfunctional role of regulating blood sugar. But the true hormone that regulates blood sugar is, glycan, is glucagon, not insulin. Insulin has to be available slightly to allow sugar to enter certain cells. But insulin should not be the one that's regulating blood sugar. That's glycogen. Insulin has a variety of other quarterback hormonal functions. Protein synthesis, cholesterol synthesis, cancer surveillance, a variety of other hormonal effects. And only a very minor role in terms of, of, of blood sugar management. But the reason we associate with blood sugar management is because it was discovered by Banting and Best in a type 1 diabetic who clearly had a blood sugar issue related to a lack of insulin. So we've made that connection, just like we made the connection of testosterone to males and of estrogen and progesterone to females. But every cell in the human body has an insulin receptor. Every cell in the human body has an estrogen receptor, male or female. Why? 
because estrogen, insulin, testosterone, human growth, at least uh, uh, progesterone, do not only have sexual function. They have functions in every cell. They regulate pathways, physiologic pathways, in every single cell in our body, well beyond sexual function. And that is important to understand because while male XY, we tend to be testosterone dominant, females also produce testosterone. And while high levels of testosterone make me a man, make me male, and I'm not going to get into the politics of all this bullshit, that's what testosterone does. Okay? You can inject that into an XX and you can get uh, 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 have male characteristics come on board. But I don't want to go into that. But testosterone creates the maleness in me, but testosterone is also one of the four dominant anabolic hormones. It governs protein synthesis, um, governs a number of storage functions in the cells of the body, in the liver, uh, in other organs. It's not just there for big muscles and male sexuality. So all women also produce testosterone. Here's the interesting thing. When women eat a lot of carbohydrates and their insulin levels are low in the hyperinsulinemic, Obese woman, they get polycystic ovarian syndrome. What's PCOS? It's an elevated level of testosterone. I've talked a lot, and you've got a couple of videos coming up on my YouTube channel about sleep. And one of the things that I learned on a trip in po to Poland a few years ago was something called 555. In other words, never get out of bed later than 5.55 a.m. Now, that, that applies to me. You can choose your own time. But the key thing there is no matter how poorly you slept the night before, if you don't sleep in because you're tired, if you get up at the same time, you may be tired that day, but you're going to sleep well the next night. You're going to go to bed early. You're going to have a much better night's sleep, and you're going to get back on track with your sleeping. <laughs> but it doesn't, doesn't mean that you're not going to have a horrible day. So one of the hacks that I've had, if I've been up operating or if I've been really not sleeping well, I still get up at 5.55. I'm still going to have my regular cup of coffee, but I'm also going to have a ketone IQ. And what this ketone IQ does, it gives me that early morning bounce. So that even if I've had very little sleep or even if I've had a, a poor quality of night's sleep, sometimes we take tough things to bed with us and they wake us up. The ketone IQ helps me to manage the next day without the awful fatigue and brain fog and inability to focus. It reconcentrates me. Of course, I have my coffee. But it reconcentrates me. It helps me to get through that tough day. I am still going to go to bed early the next night. I can assure you I'm going to have a good night's sleep. But I've had a good day. I've managed and converted a bad day to a tolerable day using ketone IQ. So if you're going to, if you're going to put a woman on testosterone, you want to be very cautious to know what their free testosterone level is before you give them that. I see a number of patients in my practice coming in from other doctors. They're obese. They've got polycystic ovarian syndrome or they had PCOS. And their hormone replacement therapy doctors put them on super high doses of testosterone to increase their libido, to make them feel good. Well, they're already running high. And that persistently high level of testosterone in a female causes problems, just like it does in males. I've got males who super inject testosterone because, oh, they want to be on Schwarzenegger. Yeah, he did. Um, but it's got a lot of side effects when you go super high. When you're low, you can correct in males. But the correction is not for the sexual function. The correction for low testosterone in males and for low testosterone in women Rarely in women. I'm not a fan of testosterone in women. I'm not a fan of testosterone in women. But in men, that low T has got nothing to do with the sexuality. It's got nothing to do with the muscles. It's got to do with feeling better generally. It's got to do with the cellular function of testosterone in the non-sexual, non-male dominated or non-gender non related testosterone function. In a very, very similar fashion. And I've had a conversation with a few perimenopausal women. These women will tell you, I'm awfully fatigued. Why am I so, why have I got so much brain fog? I can't sleep. I'm exhausted all the time. I feel like crap. Hot flashes, they, not just the hot flashes, they're just miserable. So in my body, in my, as a male, I'm producing estrogen. Oh yes, I am. I doesn't, don't go manly or non-manly on me on that. 
Estrogen is important for every cell in my body, but I'm going to be producing estro estrogen at a uh, at a static level, at a baseline level, my entire life. It may go down a little bit as I get older. If you get fatter, you're going to have more peripheral estrogen conversion uh, as a male. But estrogen levels are pretty static. If you're a female, you produce estrogen and it's cyclical. You're cycling through estrogen and progesterone. Those are the hormonal cycles that are govern pregnancy. But you've got always got estrogen available higher and lower, which is the gynecologic component. But estrogen levels are always elevated. And now you go through menopause and boom, crash. And we measure someone a year or two after menopause and their estrogen levels are unmeasurable. And they're miserable. They're miserable. And they're not miserable for gynecologic reasons. They've got brain fog because every brain, every brain cell has an estrogen receptor. And if you're not triggering that, you're getting all the brain issues with, uh, 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 with a lack of estrogen. So absolutely, absolutely, I've become, I've changed. And I apologize to my female patients. I've become a huge proponent and not an antagonist of low-level hormone replacement therapy in females that are post- or perimenopausal. Whether you've had your ovaries and, and uterus taken out as a young woman, or you've gone through natural menopause, the involution, supplying, measuring, first of all measuring, DHEA, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone levels, we measure them routinely in our males and our females, but then supplying some at a low level, not for the gynecologic function, but for the brain function, for the whole body function. And you will feel so much better. Obviously, it's each female's decision whether or not she could benefit from it. I saw somebody the other day that had her uterus and ovaries taken out for cancer when she was in her mid-30s. She's now in her 60s. She's fine. No issues. Don't need hormone replacement therapy. Then I see somebody else who's in their early 60s, late 50s, exhausted, miserable, thyroid hormones are all over the place, hormonally healthy, but not. and we measure the numbers. They're unmeasurable. They're so low. Put her on some hormone replacement therapy, very low dose, feels fabulous. So I apologize to females. I think the concept of estrogen progesterone therapy as a hormone replacement, non-gynecologic hormone replacement, is very valid. And every woman should have that conversation with their hormone replacement therapy, therapy, therapy doctor. Whether that is a gynecologist, whether it is a family doctor, absolutely fine. However, cautions. Number one, I don't think there's benefit to being on what we call DHEA. I see people being prescribed DHEA, and I would be very, very reticent to put any woman on testosterone. I see tons coming in on high levels of testosterone. It may work, but I'd be very, very cautious. I'm not against it, but I'd be super cautious and know what the person, the person needs that's prescribing it needs to have a lot of experience and needs to underdose rather than overdose. Exactly the same with progesterone and estrogen. I like both. I don't like just one estrogen and one progesterone. I like both to be there, estradiol being the better one. How they dose the medication is up to you. It can be a cream, it can be a pessary, it can be a pill, it, it can be an implant. I don't mind how they, how they dose it. That's between you and your practitioner. But my general principles are, number one, ask the question. Ask the question, Do could I benefit from a non gynecologic perspective, could I benefit from female hormone replacement therapy? I strongly recommend a combination of low-dose estradiol and progesterone, particularly if you've still got your uterus and your ovaries. Um, and I am very reticent to prescribe testosterone. I don't prescribe it myself, but to recommend testosterone prescription in a woman. There are indications for it, but I would really discuss that with someone extremely knowledgeable and who is willing not to overprescribe? I see women on very high doses of testosterone when they've already got PC, a PCOS and high testosterone, and it screws them up. Secondly, I would not prescribe DHEA. I understand the rationale. It's a precursor for the other hormones, but why not just prescribe the hormone itself? Because I see these crazy DHEA levels becoming DHEA sulfate. The women are miserable. Stick with estradiol and progesterone, which are the active comp uh, components at low dose. And then the final thing is, Measure your numbers before you go on the medication and then measure your numbers after you've been on it for a few weeks and modify the dosing. It's a feedback system. And always recognize how you feel before you start 
and then see if there's a significant improvement without liability after you go on it. And then the final thing is, if you are going to go on estrogen and progesterone replacement, make sure you are not at very high risk for DVTs, deep vein thrombosis, you're not in atrial fibrillation, you don't have those issues going on, or if you do, make sure that you're anticoagulated, because estro estrogen in certain vulnerable people will increase the risk of venous blood clots in the legs. And you don't want a DVT, you don't want a pulmonary embolus. The second thing is, if you are at risk for genetic cancers, if you've got the MEN type disease, you've got the BRAC, the HER2 new, and you are not metabolically healthy, you're still eating a standard American diet, if you're ketogenic or carnivore, I have less of a concern here because those are antidotes for the hyperinsulinemic uh, treatment of, of the cancers. Different video. But if you are metabolically unhealthy or you've got type 2 diabetes, you may be, no, not the type 2 diabetes, if you're obesogenic, you may be vulnerable to an increased risk of cancers. Both, both gynecologic cancers, breast, uterus, ovary, cervix, which is part of the uterus, but also non-gynecologic cancers. But you're at risk of cancer anyway if you're obesogenic, like I am. So those are all things that you can discuss with a metabolic doctor like myself. Those are things that you ought to be able to discuss with a hormone replacement therapist, but often they don't have the knowledge. And often all they have is an algorithm of, I'm going to give you this much. Make sure that it's somebody knowledgeable that is prescribing. But again, I apologize to my female patients that I have not been more aggressive about addressing and at least asking the question. So please come at me, ask me the question. And in the comments, help me to learn. Help me to learn. I'm not female. I see a lot of female patients. I try to learn from them. But share your thoughts, share your experiences, leave comments. And if you like what we're talking about, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. It doesn't cost you anything. I, I saw that the other day on, on somebody else's channel I was watching. It said, it costs you nothing to subscribe to this channel. But it helps us out. The metrics help us to make this more available to other people on these channels. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. If you want to consult, 561-517-0642. Throw us a bucket Patreon or YouTube. Uh, not YouTube, uh, Patreon or PayPal, uh, the, the address is in the show notes. Till next time.